um, and I couldn't resort, uh, resist this. Don't know how many West Wing fans there. Uh, we'll be holding um, iPad office hours in February. This is also another way that we call a snow day, so look forward uh, to that. Um, so this is, uh, we will advertise this starting tomorrow morning, first come, first serve. This is 30 minutes to come and your beef, your idea, your need, your thought, uh, what you would like to communicate to the IPAC crew. Um, and if it's about a, a partnership that you need or an uh, operational resource or an idea uh, that you want to bounce, this is the time to come talk to us. So these are iPad office hours um, and we'll see if we can provide some cheese. Um, I'm really, really excited about this. Uh, this kind of this came bottom up from our community. Actually, Caroline Woods got us started on this with working with Clemens Kinchin. So uh, they are a food pantry on our campus to assist students with dietary needs and, and around kind of um, scarce resources around food, really. And you'd be surprised the percentage of our students uh, for for whom this is a daily concern. Um, so we did a. a pantry drive in October, so we were successful and excited about that. But uh, this summer, we've now teamed up with SLS uh, and other uh, partnerships around the pop-up uh, food markets, and we will be helping stand up a market starting this summer. So if you're on SNAP at $6 per share, low income 12, uh, others can come in at $25 regular cost or donate at 40, and you're able to attend the market on a regular basis. So we would love to bring this resource to our campus and extend our partnership throughout the community. Um, many of the folks you've been hearing from and will continue to hear from throughout the semester are GVU uh, iPad engagement grants. So I mentioned Clint, Clint coming in and talking about our work in wearable technology. Uh, likewise, Chris Ledantic, and you'll be hearing from these other teams. The whole point of their funding is that they are to be engaging the community and building out this research portfolio of ideas. So uh, look for the names, the topics. These guys get the award for the longest title, um, but it's about aging and mild cognitive impairment. Um, and uh, find them and engage and find out how we're gonna do bigger and better things going forward. So again, for those of you, uh, there's a few new faces in the town hall today. So this is iPad in one slide, shaping the future of human-centered systems, environments, and technologies to promote satisfying, healthy, and productive lives. We focus around catalyzing interdisciplinary research, bringing you all together, convening, providing the continuity and capacity to do that research, advocating for socio-technical change, and then, of course, educating human-centered scientists, engineers, policymakers, and designers, not just our students, but our partners and really our whole community. And we do that around these four research uh, pillars. So some new news in this. In the lifelong health and well-being, some of us are still on the recovery plan from the Engineering Research Center uh, preliminary proposals that went in earlier this month, and we'll be continuing to build that out. I build out those ideas, for, so look for those opportunities. Uh, kudos and excitement <clears throat> to uh, the Pediatric Technology Center, which was partially incubated in IPAT when it started. So in a couple of Fridays, they're receiving the Georgia Bio Golden Helix uh, Community Award, so we're very, very excited for them. Um, and Megan is here. You can ask her about the deployment of uh, the MLA funded passport for kids uh, at the Affleck Cancer Center uh, going on right now. So very happy she's here with us. Um, we're excited about new, all sorts of new relationships with Emory, including this R21 around uh, biofeedback around uh, gait with stroke rehabilitation um, and a whole bunch of work. Uh, and Matt hates it when I just wave my hand. A uh, tremendous amount of work, and you're going to hear about it a little bit more later uh, with respect to our infrastructure for our research systems, including the migration of the CMS, our Medicaid data sets, um, as we move over to CODA. So in smart cities and inclusive innovation, again, a lot of things that are going on. Uh, perhaps most exciting at the top is the renewal for the Georgia Smart Community Challenge um, and the partnership with the Atlanta Regional Commission to do that. Um, and then coupled with that new for this year is a way for our students to get involved with the Georgia Smart Community Core. So please go to the website and check out both of those. Both of those opportunities are live right now with applications closing in the March-ish time frame. Um, some of our work on scholarship, so highlighting work by Jennifer Clark and others on her work in regional studies. So looking at the larger policy implications around shifting labor forces, and we're gonna pick up on the tenor of some of those discussions today when we talk about the future of work. Um, and then Deborah, Christy, and team have been helping or hosting 
um, a tremendous number of events and workshops and symposia bringing the community together around this still emergent research pillar for us. In shaping the human technology frontier, yes, you saw a lot of critters running around. So we hosted the uh, first time in the US ACM Animal Computer Interaction Conference uh, with Melody Moore Jackson as the host of that. Um, and I don't know, I would actually love to see the combination. Clint, can we get the, the doggies in this one involved in the fashion expo in this one? I think that would be cool. Okay, so, um, and you'll hear more about this when Clint talks about wearable fashion. Uh, more on Clint, Nostalgic Futures, uh, which as you remember was part of GVU's anniversary last last year, is now on an exhibition, exhibition in the Clough Learning Center. And then you're going to hear more about the future of sports from Laura Levy, uh, Shiva, and many, many others. And as you can imagine, lots of involvement uh, with the upcoming Super Bowl. So uh, more work in socio-technical systems. You can tell, Ross, I did not get rid of the Harrison Ford uh, picture of him. But we're excited about uh, the continued engagement in Savannah. Um, we also completed phase one of our work with Georgia Public Broadcasting on looking around analytics around the future of viewership. Uh, so that was a new partnership for us. Um, and I already mentioned the upcoming think tanks. So I think I'm already out of time. Am I already out of time, Mary Beth? I'm pretty much out of time. So I'm going to switch to passing through these slides quickly to say the future of work involves a lot of different opportunities that Mary Beth is going to talk to you about. And in particular, we're teeing up for a set of emergent opportunities out of NSF. So this is a new program around the future of work at the human technology frontier. And so this is an active one. I don't know if the, the deadline has changed post shutdown. Not yet. Uh, so we're kind of hoping it's going to shift a little, but it's an early March deadline. Um, and in particular, it's everything around opportunities for human technology partnership on many performance, all the way through and including the socio-technical landscape. And a lot of interest in understanding the risk and benefits of AI are within this. Um, so these are the themes that you're gonna hear us touching on in a myriad of ways. Um, one of the things that we will turn to at the very end with our knowledgeable panel is that NSF has embraced what they call convergent research, which is kind of interdisciplinary research on steroids. Uh, because it also has to have a strong translational component. And in particular, they're stymied at the relationship of kind of the innovation of computing engineering, but how to have rigorous social sciences and policy integrated into this. So Kay and others are going to help us understand how to do that. Um, and then the other thing that's coming into this is um, a new program will be emerging called Convergence Accelerators. And so the NSF folks have described this as DARPA light, which I suspect terrifies them a little because uh, NSF likes being different than DARPA, but it is going to have a focus on innovation with a strong translational pipeline. Um, and so if you look at these calls for proposals, it seems just perfect for Georgia Tech in terms of the, the base of research that we have, uh, the talent that we have, as well as applying and connecting everything from basic science, um, basic social sciences, all the way through the applied work in GTRI, um, as well as the, the large set of partnerships that we could bring to the table. So this is kind of ours for the taking if we get our act together. A lot of teams have been working more in this space, but iPad is here to try to, to foment these discussions um, and to support you in this process. So the goals for today is we want to unpack our expertise around the human technology frontier, its potential and risk for the future of work. We want to connect research activities to Georgia Tech's future educational plans. So Rich DeMello is going to be speaking with us in a few minutes about how we can do that. And then uh, we're going to spend a bit of time leveraging our deep expertise in healthcare um, because we've, we've been working at the future of healthcare delivery, which is one of the work domains. So how do we draw those connections? And then we, again, we'll come back to our closing panel for how do we catalyze convergent research. So this is the agenda. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mary Beth. She's setting timer. her timer. I have a timer here. I'm going to see how fast. We had a competing unreasonable number of times. All right. Meanwhile, I'm also texting with my husband because this morning we diagnosed a leaking refrigerator because there was a giant pool of water outside on our carport, which is a disturbing thing to happen. Um, yeah. Um, all right. So I was asked to chart the future 
of work at the human technology frontier. And so Beth and I spent a while thinking about what, what would that mean to chart that. And what the, I kept saying, well, what do we want people to walk away from, from, this, uh, with, from this presentation? And so real quick, I was gonna talk about what we mean by human tech frontier research. Um, and really our goal was to uh, kind of give you a flavor of all the different projects on campus that are going on that we feel are, are related to this domain and hopefully get excited about collaborating with some of those folks or starting up your own uh, initiative. Um, because ultimately the goal here is convergent research, which I know is like a buzzword that keeps popping up everywhere. But one of the things that really excites me about doing research like in the wearable domain is I don't think you can do that research without having this real transdisciplinary team because the technology is really only the first step of it, right? So, all right, we want to uh, you know, develop these new technologies that are connecting us and our world, um, but ultimately what we care about is that uh, the machines and us, that we are able to operate in harmony, whatever that means, right? And there isn't even a right answer to what that means. I mean, we, there's some very deep philosophical questions we have to ask ourselves about who we will become 50 years from now as we become more tightly integrated with our technology. And so like Black Mirror is a fantastic, it, it's for me, it's just like kind of reviewing, it's a, these little vignettes that explore what is gonna happen, what could happen to our society when this particular technology is injected. And sometimes the technology is very realistic. Like, what if I was able to record everything that happened to me all the time and I could replay it? That's not outlandish, right? But then in the story, they explore all the ways that that would change drastically the way people interact with each other and would have this incredibly deep impact on our, uh, on our culture and society. So doing this HTF research, you have to be working with people and expertise in all of these different realms like public policy, sociology, psychology, uh, design, um, in order to not just make this technology and throw it out into the world and have it do horrendous things or maybe do nothing because it's not doesn't fit um, into the network in which it was injected. So, um, so real quickly now, I'm going to just kind of walk through these different categories of HTF research that's going on all around campus. Um, some of it is directly future of work related and some of it is, is uh, kind of uh, related in an ancillary way. Um, and so I'll, I'll start with kind of the very fundamental kernel of any of this work, which is about the technology, right? And about how we're going to be enhancing ourselves, augmenting ourselves, perhaps augmenting our physical bodies with exoskeletons. Um, or uh, you know, perhaps augmenting ourselves cognitively but a really interesting aspect of this sort of work, and this is like something that, that Clint, we keep talking about Clint Ziegler, you know, this is uh, at heart his work, which is, yes, I'm inventing new technology, but as soon as it is going onto the body, there's a whole bunch of additional considerations that you have to work around. It's not just usability in like, does someone know where this button is and they can click? It's also, how does this feel on the body? How do people react to me when they see me wearing it and using it? Um, and so there's a whole class of research going on here around helping, pig, helping people figure out how to make those sort of decisions, designers. Like, given the, the, the goals of this wearable system, where should I place it on the body? And how can I do so in a way that's more accessible and inclusive? Um, and how can I design these interventions such that they don't just work in the lab, but people are comfortable using them out in, in the world and the, everyone around them is comfortable with them using them. Uh, and so uh, some of this, I think one of the, the, the key lessons that, that we've all been learning is that we need to do some investigation of policy and the potential societal impacts of this technology before we even begin. Because understanding the, uh, the policy landscape, anticipating what changes might need to happen with policy or regulatory changes, that can have very early impacts even on what technology you, building blocks you start using when you build this intervention. Um, and so like over at CACP, Paul Baker has been thinking very deeply about what is this whole process, this, this is really an, a, illustrating a transdisciplinary process for a team to tackle designing like a wearable um, intervention of some sort. Um, 
So, but kind of back to the technology, <clears throat> it's also very important to do evaluation. So those of us that are technologists, I have people come to me all the time that say, well, we're, really, we're really excited to use AR for this or that, uh, augmented reality. Um, and I'm always saying, well, why? Why do we think that that would be better, right? And so uh, uh, Thad Starner's order picking research is a good example of, all right, let's do like a Pepsi challenge. We think that a heads up sexy wearable thing might be better than some of the existing order picking methods, but we need to show that for real, right? And for, I, th I think there's a big barrier right now. I know just personally working in AR, there's a barrier. It's easy to make demos and companies will make these demos and be like, oh, this is exciting. And then it's not making the leap into really being deployed within their organization. And it's because often this piece is missing or when they do this piece, they realize, oh, actually, maybe it's not really worth um, uh, investing in this fancy tech yet. Um, you know, this slide is kind of reminding us that the technologies we're talking about aren't just sensors and, and input devices that we're like putting on the body or IoT that we're putting in the world, but these tools, they may be interfaced with on a desktop, um, but it's bringing to bear these, um, you know, complex uh, machine learning and data analytics uh, algorithms and new visualization techniques that support decision makers in, uh, you know, making sense of all of this new data that we're able to collect and then make, uh, you know, much more informed, hope, hopefully effective decisions within their systems. Um, one of the things uh, that, one of the areas that I believe that these, these uh, emerging technologies like wearables and mixed reality, uh, where it can really impact work um, is specifically in the in training um, and even more specifically training where the physical world and physical objects are a very important part of the job um, training where currently the way you'd learn is by going into the field you know going into these different environments or uh, getting to experience different versions of this physical system uh, to be able to learn how to work effectively inside of it um, and so these are just some examples of work going on. Uh, some of it's with Emory. This involves Symptegrate. This involves people at um, IMTC. Um, you know, looking at scenarios like the operating room, where you have teams trying to do decision making under stress and, and communicating with each other and seeing if we can use uh, mixed reality to uh, be able to create training environments for that, that otherwise it's very hard to do. You have to just do role playing and um, you know, bring a bunch of real life people together or um, uh, looking at, talking about the concept of manipulating physical objects, there's, you know, actually cleaning up and sterilizing spaces, um, you know, in a highly infectious disease ward or donning the personal protective equipment uh, uh, before you go into the, to that facility. Um, so anyway, so there's a lot of figuring out how we, these immersive technologies can aid us in that very particular type of training. All right, so the physical world, there's another aspect of the physical world, which is we are also having new work environments. So we're doing the work in different sorts of physical settings. So uh, there's a cohort of people in, in uh, engineering psych uh, that are examining like what happens when the autonomous car also becomes a mobile office that you're working in. Um, what happens when you have people working very, like very synergistically with automation, with robots? What is that human automation interaction that is effective but is also um, appropriate, you know, uh, uh, acceptable to the human and safe? And of course, accessibility is a big uh, uh, part of this equation as well. To make sure that we're not inadvertently excluding more people from the future of work. Uh, you know, through these innovations. Um, it's not just the changing work environment, but the changing employment models, right? So as we're seeing more jobs becoming this contingent employment or gig economy sort of job, um, now uh, supports that used to be there for employees are, are going away. So this is a project that was done in collaboration with a startup company that was looking to provide some of those services to the gig worker that they're not currently getting. So uh, helping you figure out what the right gig job might be for you, helping you learn strategies to do those jobs uh, 
successfully and also to make money. Uh, because sometimes you could be doing these jobs and not really understanding that you're, you know, you're really not making very much. Um, and so, you know, ultimately helping people kind of empower them to get the most they can out of a, a uh, employment model that, that can have a lot of negative uh, impacts. Um, and a, a component of that, again, is, is accessibility. And so uh, Nathan Moon is looking very specifically at what impact does this gig economy have on the employment of people with disabilities? So there's the upside, which is it may actually allow uh, more entry into the workforce. Um, you know, uh, it's flexible. Uh, but the downside can be now there's no one there helping to accommodate you in this job necessarily, and it may result in underemployment. So it's very important for us, you know, to again examine these new technologies, models, environments to make sure that we're not um, excluding people. Uh, this is an example. This work it was in collaboration with uh, ACT, uh, the testing company, and they they create all these tests, and over time they realized. There's no value from the test if people don't get value from the result, right? Um, beyond, oh, I made a 33 on the ACT, so now I can go to college, right? And so in particular, they have um, an assessment around interest that's supposed to help guide people um, into the uh, appropriate educational and career paths. But the problem they found was that although, although the test is very valid, no one knows what to do with the feedback when they get it. and so. Uh, we did this really kind of in-depth, deep dive into how teens think about careers and, ed and future education, um, how they start to make these decisions um, early on, and how you could create these micro experiences. You know, rather than I took this test and here's like a website of info, how can I kind of interweave some of these experiences into their regular lives so that as I'm out in the world living my life, he, this system is able to kind of reach out and say like, hey, are you interested, you know, are you interested in that movie you just saw? You know, if you like, like, if you think you might want to do 3D graphics, this is how you would do so. Or um, what is it like to be an ER doctor? You know, what is it like to uh, be an architect? Uh, so getting a lot more value out of some of these assessments that are already out there. Um, in the kind of the, so beyond the kind of guiding you toward the uh, a, a work path that might work for you, there's also the what if you need coaching? Right now, job coaching is a very heavyweight sort of service where a real person is there face to face with you. Um, this may be for someone with a disability who needs to uh, have special accommodations at their job. Um, and so, uh, folks at CATIA and in computing and at IMPC. We're looking at ways to use these wearable technologies to uh, support this off-site job coaching. So um, not only can one coach serve a lot of, of uh, customers, but uh, that coach can also provide, again, kind of micro coaching right when it's needed. Um, and uh, Thad Starner is even taking that a step farther and looking at uh, this passive tactile learning. So helping people develop these motor skills without them even consciously having to learn them. So uh, for example, with this project, they're looking at how could you help train stenographers just by wearing this vibrating glove. Um, now, to go back out to the 10,000 foot view, you realize as you're developing these interventions and thinking about you know, what a, someone in a particular, a particular type of person or a particular domain might need, ultimately that all exists in these very complex networks, right, where the nodes are employers and different educational institutions and government agencies and communities. And, um, and so Paul uh, Baker and others at CACP are really examining deeply uh, what needs to happen within the network or how the network needs to change to adapt to some of these new uh, uh, HTF opportunities. Um, and similarly, uh, Jennifer Clark is looking at um, you know, can we figure out ahead of time what sort of policy actions need to take place in different regions, anticipating things like increasing automation or drastic changes um, in how training is delivered? All right, so, so to finish, I'm, I think I'm going to be over by like 20 seconds. Uh, this is just an example 
of a convergent project that I'm working on that hopefully NSF will want to lead. But I put this up here to show, uh, we'll want to fund, um, because this shows, the ultimate question that we're looking at is, when is it worthwhile to use AR for training? And when I say worthwhile, that that's a lot of different dimensions, right? It's not just ultimately what is augmented reality good for, but where does it make sense to deploy in terms of financial considerations and, and uh, community considerations? And even if we figure all this out, how can we disseminate that knowledge in a way that practitioners building training systems can use what we have found? And so this kind of shows like the research activities of this group, which includes folks from policy, engineering psych, instructional design, computing, um, to kind of have this feedback loop of understanding what work, what's needed in terms of training and what's happening in the future of work, doing fundamental augmented reality research, turning that into tools that can be disseminated out into uh, learners uh, who can build real interventions and those can be evaluated, ta-da. Um, so that is my very quick thing that I did as fast as I could. Almost three. Good. I hope so. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so if you haven't read if you haven't read the the, the CNE report, um, um, I'm not going to walk you through it. But but um, because it's talking about the future of education at a place like Georgia Tech, um, work and the future of work, the future of the workplace, really informs everything that's in the um, in the report. Um, the, the the two things to keep in mind um, about about the 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 CNE recommendations are that um, the number of high school graduates is going down. So, so almost every university in the country will have a smaller portion of its work devoted to undergraduates, traditional undergraduates, um, and 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 more of its effort uh, applied to younger learners. So, what we now consider to be non-traditional. Um, uh, university learners, uh, and 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 then this large population um, of people that are are, are mid career uh, and trying to cope with changes in the in, in the workplace. So I thought what I'd do today is kind of pull together the the threads from the the CNE report that address that particular issue. I want to just kind of show you the projects that that jump out at you in this in this area. Um, the, the time horizon for CNE is 20 years. So, so everything that we're saying today, um, by the time uh, I'm retired and, 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 and you folks all have gray hair, uh, will, be, will be complete nonsense because the world will, will have changed. But we're at the beginning of this process of trying to figure out what, what kinds of, of, of research um, uh, can, be, can be applied to this world that's undergoing Dramatic, dramatic change education. Um, so, so the um, the the CNE report really really has has three major components to it. Um, uh, one is this thing called the, the Georgia Tech commitment to a lifetime education. We struggle with lifetime versus lifelong. Um, uh, lifetime for us kind of has a different meaning than lifelong um, lifelong education. So the point of of this commitment is to prepare students for the year 2040, 20 years. Um, 
when demographics, multiple career paths, churn of knowledge um, require episodic, agile, intense, lifetime investment in learning. Uh, and, and when you see the projects, you'll see those themes kind of, kind of jump out at you. I'll come back to those uh, in a second. Um, the other two parts of the report are really, are really interesting, and, and I, I'd advise you to, um, to take it um, uh, and, and uh, go on vacation with it or something, read it on an airplane. Um, th th there's a bunch of research initiatives that, that are, are, I think, in themselves uh, uh, pretty, pretty interesting. And then, and then the idea of becoming a deliberately innovative culture. How do you, how do you think about education in a different way uh, if you've sort of decided, well, we're not going to be marching 18-year-old high school graduates into classrooms for 15 weeks uh, at a time. We're going to be doing something else. Um, so I like, to, I like to begin with what is our sense of the future? Uh, so, so our sense of the future that, that we're looking at this, this 2040 horizon for is that, is that most students will be, will be younger than 18 or older than 24. Um, we're almost to that point now. Um, if you look at the growth in the online master's, uh, master's programs, we have now passed um, um, the 30% um, mark, I believe. So, so we've increased the enrollment of Georgia Tech by 30% by 30 uh, almost overnight. Um, no one has really noticed that we've added all of these, um, uh, all of these, these students. Uh, and, and as we look at, the, at younger students, um, as I said, those, those will be the bulk of our, uh, of our new, new learners. Degrees, credentials uh, will be a smaller fraction of educational products. We think today of people coming into college to get a degree. Uh, well, if a 50-year-old is coming back, the 50-year-old is probably not looking for a degree. He's, he or she is looking for some other kind of educational product that we haven't invented um, yet. Uh, there's going to be a declining market for disciplinary education. You can see this already. Uh, in the market studies that we did as part of the CNE reports, the students, freshmen, when they show up on campus, don't talk to us about majoring in ECE or computing or, 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 or mechanical engineering. Um, you ask them what they want to do, and they'll say things like space. What? We don't have a degree called called space, and they don't care. Uh, it's it's a, it's a set of problems. It's a set of that uh, of aspirations. Um, uh, career paths will be complex. You heard about this. Uh, already just walk down the street, walk into any WeWork facility uh, and, and, and see, see how people are planning on spending the next 15 or 20 years of their, of their, their career. Uh, episodic, um, uh, episodic education, I think, is, is tied to that. Um, you know, we're used to this model where people show up at, at 18, spend four years in college, and then work for the next 40 or 50 years. Um, that's not a model that's sustainable. Uh, and so, so um, people are coming back for educational experiences um, uh, episodically through their lives. It's driven by life events, driven by, by technology concerns, driven by um, um, changes in life circum circumstance. Um, they're, looking, they're looking for, um, um, for, um, for value from their educational uh, uh, experiences. So, so you're going to see in a second a couple projects that, that kind of break glass in a traditional traditional university. A registrar's office is a deeply stovepiped uh, information information system that almost no one understands. And so so if you're in this episodic learning uh, mode and you're coming back and piecing together um, uh, one thread from computer science at Georgia Tech and a certificate from um, from uh, Atlanta Tech and and some um, some ver uh, verified certificates from uh, from Coursera uh, or, or edX and a couple endorsements from LinkedIn. Uh, what do you make of that? No registrar can handle that sort of stuff. Uh, and, and so making sense of that from both the learner's point of view and the, and the employer's point of view uh, adds value to the, the institutions that figure out how to, um, uh, how, how to do it. Um, I was glad you mentioned personalized medicine. So, so the same, the same kind of discussion that informs personalized medicine also makes sense for for education. Personalized, not mass-produced delivery of educational um, educational services. We spent a long time at Georgia Tech figuring out what we wanted to do with on online, and then came back to say, so what, what else is there in the world? There's face-to-face. -face. There's, there's there's personal uh, personal interaction. Human human experiences. 
uh, in this future uh, are going to be ascendant because all the other stuff, all the stuff that can be mechanized will be commoditized and available pretty pretty cheaply. So what you're left with uh, are these set of, of, of uh, uh, person to person experiences. Um, and then, and then the, one of the phrases that, that crops up a lot in the report is this idea of churn of knowledge, which I think really gets to the heart of the future, future of work. We produce students uh, uh, who go into, into technology-based um, industries, technology-informed industries. And one of the things that we know about those industries is that whatever skills we teach them um, uh, and test them for when they, they graduate uh, are going to be um, not very relevant by New Year's. And so, and so this idea that, that, that there is in, in industries that are undergoing dramatic disruptive shifts, a constant churn of knowledge and, and managing that churn of knowledge is a good predictor of long-term success in your career is a really important observation. We don't internalize that much in the, in the university. We don't provide skills for people to manage the churn, um, the churn of knowledge. But, but it's, it's clearly an important component of what we're going to do um, to um, um, to produce students that are successful uh, long term, and then and then um, this idea of, of non cognitive education. What do you do with all the stuff that you can't measure? Um, you hear you hear over and over again from employers that that long term success in my company is determined by um, uh, by ethics and leadership and and. Uh, and, and judgment and uh, 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 media literacy and, 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 and things that we don't really have ways of, of measuring and, uh, and assessing. But, but if you kind of bundle all that up and say it's our, it's our job to produce uh, students that, that, that are rounded in the sense that their entire personality has been shaped by their educational experience at Georgia Tech, even though we don't know how to assign a letter grade to that. Um, People that figure that out are going to be well positioned, I think, in the in the world of work. Um, so let's go. So let's go. Let, let's go through quickly um, uh, some of the things that that I, I think are, are are projects that that um, that deal with this. So there's a big there's a big component of the report having to do with with uh, with AI. I'm not going to give you an AI pitch. Um, you can invite Ashok to to come in and talk about Jill, Jill Watson. What I want to do. Is focus on something that. Oops, what did I do? There we go. What I what I what I want to do is focus on something that people don't much think about, which is which is what what is the future of training AIs in education? So let's suppose we have an army of Jill Watsons floating. Around. Who programs those 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 agents? How do you know that the agents are operating to the benefit of of students? Um, there's a really good um, set of analogies here. One of them is the obvious one. Uh, just look at the three laws of robotics from, from uh, um, Isaac Isimov's um, books. You should probably agree, all of us who produce this kind of technology, uh, to, to, to make sure that the technologies work to our benefit uh, and, and that there's a sense of human agency. There's a really good book that Paul Doherty, CTO from Accenture, uh, just came out with. Uh, kind of down in the in, in the corner there, called called um, uh, human plus machine reimagining work in the in the age of AI. This is a topic that applies directly to universities. So, so what we're thinking is, you really ought to have a school of education in a place like Georgia Tech that educates the AIs that are used to educate human human beings. So so what does that um, what does that that mean? Uh, that means that we we ought to have a set of people in our workforce who are not only good at training the AIs and explaining what they do and sustaining their, um, um, their, their 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 knowledge base, but also deal with the responsibility aspects of the human machine um, machine um, uh, ecosystem, ensuring accountability, fairness, transparency, honesty, and human agency. And so, this idea of human agency is at the bottom of of this. Um, we we tend to look at AI as something. That we can kind of let loose free in the uh, in the world and let it make decisions, not kind of acknowledging that, you know, this is our machine. Um, we have control of the algorithms. We have to take responsibility for what's there. We actually have the ability to control um, what it does. 
Um, I mentioned, I mentioned um, uh, the registrar's uh, office. So there's a bunch of projects having to do with kind of recreating the marketplace in, in educational, I don't wanna to wanna to say credentials, but, but educational products that signal skills, that signal levels of achievement, that, skill, uh, that signal, signal um, uh, knowledge. And um, we're sort of along, far along this path, farther along the path than I would have anticipated. We're, also, we're already issuing blockchain credentials. Um, if I had thought ahead far enough, I would have, I would have given you the, the QR code for credentials for attending, attending today. We'll have to remember to do that for next time. Yeah. Yep. Um, Georgia Tech Atrium. Um, what is the Georgia Tech Atrium? The Georgia Tech Atrium is to Georgia Tech uh, what, um, um, what the Apple Store uh, is to IBM. It's a completely disruptive way of thinking about how, how it, you interact with, with a set of communities, how you build, uh, how you build brands. So in this world where 18 year olds are not gonna show up in large numbers on the Georgia Tech campus to sit in classrooms, most of our interactions aren't going to be here. We've said they're gonna be human interactions, but where are they gonna take place? They're gonna take place in spaces that we haven't really invented yet. So the idea of the Georgia Tech uh, atrium uh, is that it becomes a reflection of what this new kind of education is to the people who actually never sit in Georgia Tech, Georgia Tech classrooms. It's personal, it's human, uh, it involves mediation by people that, that we haven't really trained yet. Uh, it will involve a genius bar or whatever, whatever that turns out to be in this, um, in this, this world. We're gonna have, a, in the CODA building, we're gonna have a couple thousand square feet of, of space to play with the, the atrium and it's a perfect place uh, to think about um, kind of iPad style, uh, iPad style projects, uh, we'll be able to prototype a lot of things there. Um, human library is another one, another another way of thinking about how people uh, interact. Human library is what it sounds like. You lend people, not books. So 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 it's it's the idea that that a lot of education in this new world takes place by personal interactions between between people. So if you're if you're a civil engineer and you wanna find out what happened during the Fukushima meltdown. There's two things you can do. Well, there's three things you can do. One is you can get on an airplane and go talk to the people that are there. That's enormously expensive. Um, you don't really have the ability to take a class every semester to, to Fukushima um, uh, to, to do that. You can read someone's case study of Fukushima. That filters it through the eyes of the, of the case study writer. Or you can assemble the principals who are still alive, still technologically connected, uh, using using technology, uh, and have a curated uh, kind of on-demand Uber facility for 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 putting those people virtually in front of a class, not in the seminar, not like what we're doing here, but but over an extended period of time. So the the, the, the Japanese know the Georgia Tech students' names, the Georgia Tech students' names know the 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 the, the, the Japanese. Um, um, principles, principles names, and it becomes a part of what of what you're what you're doing. How do you do that? How do you how do you think about assembling these kinds of curated individuals who have agreed, probably without compensation, uh, in order to be in, in, in involved in it? Um, there's a prototype uh, that that people use for um, uh, for teaching um, um, portions of sociology that involve marginalized populations. Um, this is not this is not kind of a, a wild-eyed idea because it's been tried out in this limited space before. We're thinking that this can be exploded and expanded into into a new kind of pedagogy. Um, personal board of directors, um, as you're going through life, you need advice as to what to do in this in this new world. There's no there's no Google search that you can run. There's no trusted uh, trusted person that you can go to that's gonna be able to track what you've done in the past, what you're going to do in the future. Um, but there, there are ways of thinking about assembling uh, social networks of stakeholders who have agreed to advise, uh, advise in individuals. We could, we could provide every Georgia Tech student, um, starting with age 15, I guess, if we wanted to, to do that, with a personal board of directors that would be informed by technology, would have access to all the predictive analytics um, that we're collecting, uh, on, on people uh, and would be uh, available to you through your 
your mobile um, mobile device. The easiest example, is anyone here besides me remember GeoCities? The easiest example to think about is GeoCities. So GeoCities did this on an extremely large scale. GeoCities assembled neighborhoods of people that cared about, about the, the brand of their, of their neighborhood. So the kids' toys neighborhood was extremely protected. It was open, was open, open to, 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 uh, uh, to children. Uh, there was a volunteer police force that kept the, the, bad, the bad people uh, out. People, uh, it was an example, a very early example of, of what the personal board of directors might be like. Um, whole person education. Um, this is a big topic. Let me just say um, that, that one of the things that, that has happened over the last five or six years is that a lot of people, probably due to um, the, um, the um, Daniel Kahneman's book more than anything else, um, people have started to look at what is it that we do by way of, 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 um, um, of human bias uh, that gets in the way of, of some of these skills that we were, we were talking about before. So, so one of the cases that, that Kahneman makes in, in his book, for example, is that the reason that, that, that snap judgment never works. It doesn't work in clinical diagnosis. It doesn't work in business. It doesn't work in the White House. It doesn't work anywhere. Uh, is, is that the only kind of judgment that matters is judgment that's informed by statistics. And he's got example after example of, of, of it. Well, there's an insight for you. Why don't, why don't, why don't, we, teach, why don't we teach that kind of decision making uh, uh, rather than taking a decision theory course or taking uh, taking a course on, on project management, why don't we take something and and give people a set of skills that are going to inform what they um, what what they what they do? So there's this thing called the I forget what it's called. It, 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 this is this is like the 160 um, uh, cognitive biases. Um, interestingly, most of those can be affected by by experience. Most of those can be can be affected by change. So you can imagine something called the science of everyday thinking that was being taught as a co-curricular activity for, um, for our classroom activity. So a bunch of projects like this, read the report. Um, there's something like 60 projects that we're currently looking at. A lot of them will spring out of discussions like this. So um, I'm Keaton Fletcher. I'm currently a postdoc with the Work Science Center, but I'm starting as an assistant professor in psychology in the fall. Um, happy to be here. I'm going to be talking about mostly what we're doing with the Work Science Center and a project that we're starting that will also turn into a lab project. Um, but really excited about it. We just started it two weeks ago. So, um, but before I dive in, I want to talk about what the Work Science Center is. I'm an industrial organizational psychologist. That's um, the basis of the Work Science Center. We apply the principles of psychology to the workforce. Um, hopefully, you guys have at least heard of what an IO psychologist is. Um, a lot of psychologists haven't, so there's that. Um, we um, 
one of the issues we run into is we know a lot in IO psychology, but it never makes it to the workforce. And that was the driving motivation behind the Work Science Center of making the principles of what we do as IO psychologists and also what our other scientist colleagues here at Georgia Tech are doing um, accessible to the end user at, in the workforce. Um, we also view it as an opportunity for education. So undergrads get involved. We create things like blogs and podcasts, white papers that are written either by students or experts in the field. Um, things that are really accessible to the public um, other than just publishing in academic uh, outlets. We focus on workers and technology, shockingly, um, and then work across the lifespan. So young uh, workers, millennials, or older adults, and then issues that the modern workforce is facing, like the gig economy, um, increasing diversity, globalization. So obviously today, we'll be diving into workers and technology and talking about um, a project that we just started at the beginning of this semester focusing on um, essentially what happens when you introduce new technology to healthcare um, teams in particular. And this was inspired actually by the Da Vinci um, robot machine. Hopefully um, some of you are at least familiar with this. It was really promising, really cool um, surgical machine that should be minimally invasive, allow you to be more precise, reduce infections, um, and be better for patients. But what we see is that implementation comes with risks for both the patients as well as um, the workers. And often because we've overlooked the fact that humans are using this. Um, and so it comes with training needs. So we have technical training needs of how exactly do you do this? How do we train um, the surgeons versus the nurses? Non-technical, so it, we've fundamentally altered how the teams are interacting with one another. It's changed the nature of the job itself. So you got into surgery because you liked getting your hands, I guess, wet, uh, I don't know, dirty? Um, hopefully not. Um, and so it's also changed like the social interactions of the teams, things along those lines. So what exactly do we need to do to compensate when we're introducing these new technologies? And then the part that really interests me as a leadership and teams researcher is um, the team itself. How is it functioning as a unit when we introduce this new piece of technology? Um, so we see that like when you introduce this new piece of technology, it disrupts team functioning. And so one of the questions that we're trying to address is how can you introduce new technology um, in a way that's minimally harmful to team dynamics or even a way that can actually enhance team dynamics. And focusing on three particular aspects of team dynamics, communication, um, so what type of information are you sharing with your teammates? How are you sharing it? Are you both understanding, um, basically, are we engaging in closed loop communication? So the way they do at Starbucks where you say your order, they repeat it back to you, um, but in healthcare. Um, coordination, so the sequencing and timing of the um, events in the team. Um, so how am I timing my behaviors versus your behaviors, especially when we've introduced new technology that can rad uh, radically change what that looks like, which throws off our processes as a team. Um, and then cognition. So how are we engaging in shared, uh, creating a shared mental model of how the task should be unfolding, what our unique roles are in the team, especially if this technology has put us in separate places, um, as opposed to being able to visually see one another and create that coordination um, of our cognitions. So right now, um, through the Work Science Center, it's mostly in the literature review process, um, and we're trying to create a practitioner toolkit for, based on research that's already been done on if you're going to be implementing new technology, here's some best practices on how to do that. Um, and then in the fall, we'll be starting a data collection on a specific version of that, but um, details to come. So sorry, really brief overview. Hopefully stayed in my five minutes. Um, yeah. So terrific, Ooh, now it's working. Uh, so uh, Brad's gonna come up uh, in a second to talk to us about Artemis, which is looking at some of the team dynamics associated with first responders. Um, but one of the things I wanted to point to with Keen's presentation is, you know, we see this story over and over again in the different types of work contexts that we're looking at. You know, what is the relationship to the team? What is the relationship to how the social engagement, training, um, coordination are all affected by technologies that on the outset seem like an obviously good idea, but it, these, this disruption ripples uh, through that. And then how do we then uh, incorporate, again, some of the ideas we've heard from Rich and Mary Beth on uh, continuing to train uh, individuals because the Da Vinci, what, 20 year or more innovation cycle, you know, bench to, to, to bedside, um, surgery side, um, but these innovations are gonna come much faster, right? So how are we going to accelerate uh, that curve? Keaton also gets uh, huge points on his certifications uh, for because we cold called him uh, to come and participate with this. So uh, new to IPAT, so thrilled to have uh, him join us. 
and looking forward to working with him and Ruth and others in the Work Sciences Lab as we build this out. So passing this now to Brad, who will tell us about Artemis. All right, very good. Uh, so part of grantsmanship is figuring out the name of the project first, right? Uh, so we came up with, with, with Artemis, uh, augmented reality testing of equipment in multiple immersive simulations. Uh, it's based on virtual reality technology, but Artemis didn't sound right. <laughs> so, so Artemis is what it was. <laughs> it's a platform for testing FirstNet enabled innovations. So how many people have heard of FirstNet, know what FirstNet is? A few of you out there. So essentially we're taking the land mobile radios, the bricks that first responders carry with them that's connected directly to a tower or, or to their peers and replacing them with LTE based technology. So something the size of your cell phone, right? Uh, it sounds rather straightforward, right? Let's just give everybody cell phones or whatever. But, but the impact of that is, is much, much greater than you might first imagine. One is now they have access to data, right? And that data in a, in a very broadband uh, way. Uh, number two, they're now connected to each other in ways that they're not connected to each other now, right? In the same county, uh, it may be difficult to connect fire and EMS and police in a coordinated fashion so that they share resources in a meaningful way. All that changes with, with FirstNet. So we designed this project to evaluate the potential for new technologies used by first responders in a, in a virtual environment. Uh, but it plays multiple roles. We can use it for training, we can use it for scenario generation, we can use it for objective testing of, of different things. It's a tool for study, the future of work for first responders. Simply put, that's what it is, um, and it, which includes police, firefighters, and EMS. Uh, and it's and, and it can, you can create this virtual reality experience. So, so basically, what we're doing is we're picking a particular situation that first responders might might um, be part of their job in an everyday way, like uh, a traffic stop, for example and then figuring out what are all the cues that an individual police officer might use in that traffic stop in the performance of their mission and recreating those in, in virtual reality. So we can test their baseline performance and diagnosing a situation, figuring out where the threat was, if there is a threat, diffusing um, uh, uh, argumentative um, uh, driver, or dealing with multiple passengers, or, or stopping someone in a crowded intersection, or stopping someone in an environment where people start coming out of their homes, right, and gathering around and holding up their cell phones and it, all those pressures, right? Uh, so we're collecting baseline data, and then we can go back and introduce new technologies and see if those technologies either make it easier or mitigate some of those stressors or mitigate some of those performance issues or do they really make it worse, right? No, we don't know yet, right? These are new technologies that we're envisioning what they might be. Um, but the point of it is an optimized objective research tool. You know, let's evaluate the future of work before it's actually here in a virtual environment. So Artemis is about scenario management. We build scenarios that are relevant to first responders and we manage those within Artemis. It's about data collection and analytics how to visualize that data in real time uh, way and then playing back that so we can learn from it. Um, so what are we gonna study in that, right? So one of the things that we could study uh, has to do with just in-time training, which we heard from previously. Uh, examples of an EMT receives life-saving instructions about a specific procedure that maybe they're not fully trained on when they experience it for the first time or police officers briefed on the management of someone with a suspected cognitive impairment on the way to the emergency, right, as it's happening. So thinking that it's, as they get dispatched, they're being prepared for their engagement in route, right? And what does that look like and how, how do we deal with that? We're also looking at human technology collaboration, you know, for example, in an AI monitoring a social media channels to identify contextual information as it's being unfolded, you know, and, and, and whatever. They, won't, they currently don't really have access to that information, but it's a rich source of, of uh, potential useful information. Or a drone gathers data from a different perspective, allowing the different perspective, allowing the police response, 
police officer will respond in a more favorable way. Or maybe it's an ad hoc, deeply integrated team networks that we need to study. You know, as people come together, um, um, for example, like an active shooter situation on a campus, uh, police officers from different communities, our, our fire, how do they coordinate, right? How do we build that network on the fly so we can do distributed um, uh, response management in a meaningful way that's different than the centralized focus management that we have now? All these are things that we want to study in, in a virtual reality environment where it's safe, where we can replicate the experiment over and over again, where we can collect baseline data, where we can introduce new technologies in a meaningful way and measure their outcome. So that's what Artemis is. Thank you. Do a very quick scene change with our three panelists coming up and grabbing a chair um, and also trying to grab some of these mics. All right, and don't blind yourself too much. All right, there should be an on switch. So, um, hopefully, you've seen that the problem that we don't have is a shortage of ideas. Uh, this is an area where there is a wealth of opportunities. Um, in some cases, there, these are areas where we have decades of work. Um, in others, we have relatively new projects and relatively new people coming uh, to the fore. Um, but one of the challenges for us is not only to do this work well and do it within our local context, but to compete uh, you know, quite well nationally. Um, there, again, as I pointed to the Convergent Accelerator coming out of the NSF, um, as well as uh, some major funding that is anticipated um, out of the OSO functional DC context um, around all things AI, uh, around the future of work and training. Um, there are going to be tremendous opportunities uh, and an opportunity for Georgia Tech to lead um, uh, quite uh, demonstrably. Uh, but to do so is going to require uh, this notion of the convergent research approach uh, situated in deep research context, uh, looking at the full societal implications, a real profound merger of kind of the interventionist style of research and computing and engineering, um, as well as kind of the reflective and model and policy approach uh, coming out of social sciences, but also coming out of psychology and other areas as well. And then how to, to manage that in a set of project teams. So I've asked three very wise women uh, to join us uh, to talk about that and uh, to give us their perspective and their advice uh, in the remaining 10 minutes that we have for this part uh, to uh, kind of point us in the right direction. Um, and um, so, Lizanne, you're closest to me. Why okay. don't you give us a start? All right. I'm Lizanne Stefano, and here on this campus I direct Seismic, which is kind of the education outreach unit uh, of the Georgia Tech campus, and I'm going to direct my comments to K-12 education uh, today. Uh, K-12 education, as you could hear from Rich's um, talk about c &E, you know, those, those uh, barriers between K-12 and higher education and continuing education are really starting to blur. Most students enter Georgia Tech with a significant number of already earned college credits. Uh, so we're reaching earlier and earlier into um, the K-12 system uh, here at Georgia Tech like many other colleges. When we're thinking about future, uh, when we're thinking about work, uh, we think about this kind of outreach as how do we prepare future workers? And when you think about that, um, we have something in Georgia called career technical agri and agricultural education. And it is a requirement so that every student in Georgia in public schools starting in middle school has to participate in this track that is intended to prepare it for work. That's a good thing. There's space in the curriculum to do this. Um, the bad thing is when you see what is taught in those tracks, it is not a good reflection of current or future workforce. So we have a space that we could contribute to try to figure out how to use that time intentionally to really bring up our next generation of workers. But when people talk about workers, I always get a little bit sad because in addition to workers, we also need future innovators and entrepreneurs. And so we have to think about in that high school experience and even before high school, middle school, elementary school, how are we thinking, how are we encouraging kids to think out of the box and get reinforced for doing that? Very often in traditional education, you actually get punished for thinking outside the box. And I'll just tell a quick anecdote. I was in Savannah uh, this a couple 
two days ago. We have an outpost in Savannah. We did for the first time our um, our innovation competition in uh, in Savannah. We do it all over uh, the innovation prize or the, the inventor prize. Uh, you might have heard about it. We do a K-12 prize this time. We took it to Savannah, 18 schools. I uh, went around, talked to the winners, did some focus groups. And one of the most common things I heard from the administrators in the school is the team that they thought were go was going to win is not the team that won. Um, the kind of the outliers, the innovative thinking, the kind of edgy kids that maybe don't get the best grades were the ones that the industry judges chose as the most patentable or, or the most legitimate. So I think that changes a little bit about what doing school means to encourage that innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, to do this, we have to not only work with the students, but we have to work with the teachers. We have to um, help teachers understand the current and future context of work and what is it important for them to do with younger students that prepares them for that. That is not in most teachers' um, toolbox. We run a program where we place teachers in industry and then help them figure out what to teach as a result. And over and over and over again, we have them say that this is transformational. This experience of knowing what is valued work is transformational. And they um, shift their curriculum to more of the the social emotional uh, soft skills. They talk about communication, but not communication in how do you communicate science to a non-technical audience, but communication in how do you communicate with coworkers? How do you record your activities so that somebody coming behind you can understand what you did? So real life communication um, skills. Just a couple other things that I that I want to hit on. Um, when you talk about working in K-12 schools, you're not only talking about kids and teachers, you're talking about families and communities. So that lifetime education, K-12 schools are a good way to connect with parents and adults who may need re-education, who may need a career change. It's a good way to naturally interface with those. And people that bring their kids to the atrium may, might also be gaining some skills themselves. And then finally, employers are very interested in K-12 education. When they're deciding about where to land, where to start a new center, where to, to um, put a new headquarters, one of the things that they often want to know is what is the quality of K-12 schools in that area, not only for their employees, but also for their future workshops. So I encourage you to think about that K-12 dimension when you're thinking about your future work. Got it? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Kay Husband Steeling, School of Public Policy, and I just wanted to give three main points today. One, what do we do in the school? Secondly, how does it relate to the future of work? And third, um, just to give you a little flavor of some a workshop that I participated in um, back uh, about um, about eleven months ago or so. So, in terms of our school. Um, we have a variety of different areas that relate to the future of work. Data analytics, obviously. I didn't light up the technology and disabilities, but you did hear a good deal about um, from Brad, and, and, and you heard also about other uh, researchers in the CACP that are part of the School of Public Policy. Organizations and the organization of science. That's a critical area for understanding the future of work. AI and ethics. We heard earlier how important it is to understand and to consider the ethical principles that go into, you know, the trolley problem, um, right? So that's an important piece as well. Um, we have folks in the room that work on smart cities and regional innovation. Um, there are a lot of other areas here that cut across um, various talents that we have in the School of Public Policy, and I just wanted to call those things out so that in, if you know us, if you want to get in touch with me, get in touch with some of the researchers and professors in the school, please do, because we have a variety of areas that we can um, inform this idea of the future of work. But what I wanted to talk about um, and, and rest on just for a minute or two is this slide. Who is producing the knowledge? Who gets to decide what knowledge is produced? I think we really need to consider that. We can't just jump in and, and assume that it's going to sort itself out. The technology will lead us. Or if you build it, they will come. Uh, we really have to understand who is at work here and for whom. 
who wins, who loses. When you're looking at organizations, the research agenda is not just about the particular, like a Georgia Tech or any of the organizations that we're talking about, what populations are involved, what different, different types of populations are involved, geography, cities, rural areas, or the nexus between the two. Processes and networks, do they exist or not? We can't just assume that they exist and that they're fluid. Recruitment of people to do this work and to train others to do the work as well and how our communications develop. So there's a danger here of reproducing existing inequalities if we do not consider who gets to decide what work is being done. I also want to bring your attention to the right side of this um, screen. And here, I want you to consider the fact that we need to assess the future of our own work. Everyone in this room is part of this process, this generation process of knowledge, of new ideas, and how to implement those ideas. But we ourselves need to consider our own diversity and our own effect on these outcomes. So it's not just the work and who gets to decide, but we need to consider the future of our own work, conceptual gaps, right? Methodological gaps, tools gaps, data gaps. And there's research to be done on that, not just the research to make sure that these things happen and we have nice new gadgets and, and connectivity, but also understand our own processes of doing the research. In addition to organizational structures, we need to understand how many economists I think these in this way. So the sociologists are usually thinking about the organizational gaps, but as an economist, I'm thinking about the incentive structures. As a political scientist, I'm thinking about the power structures. As an ethicist and philosopher, I'm thinking about ethical structures. As technologists, we're talking about technological structures and, and any gaps that exist in those areas. So I wanted you to sort of peel apart what it is that we're doing here and consider not only where these gaps are, but who is doing the work and this question, do we run the risk of reinforcing existing biases or even introducing new types of biases in the age of AI? I came up with this question, it was gnawing at me. It's not original, right? But it was gnawing at me because I heard someone say, you know, I just got a whole bunch of uh, resumes in and I just turned loose this machine on it and it sorted it and found the right people for me. I didn't even, no human was even involved. Not true. <laughs> Some program that. Um, there are biases that could have been introduced in the process, but this user had this understanding that there was no bias because no human was in the process. Not true. So as we do our work, we need to consider that. Last point. Ah, it's not oh, there. Sorry. Okay, never mind. Done. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Thank you. <laughs> That was a human in the loop error, but that's, sorry about that. that's good. <laughs> Please. Okay, I'm, I'm Lee McCook. I'm a researcher with Georgia Tech Research Institute and also Deputy Director of IPAT, working with Beth. And I'm going to address my very quick comments on the implications of how we do research with this new convergence of the future of work. Um, specifically looking at um, the NSF convergence accel accelerator. So what does that mean? So traditional NSF research might have been um, a research or small research team with a grant that has an open-ended research question uh, perhaps to answer. Uh, but now with these NSF convergence accelerators, um, they're described as more DARPA-like programs. So what does that mean to be more DARPA-like? Um, they're deliverables, they're timeframes, they're um, uh, expectations from your program manager and your program manager may be more involved than your NSF program manager. As a matter of fact, we found that some of our projects, our program managers are actually part of our project teams and come to our project meetings and uh, present our projects uh, along with us. Um, they're complex problems that solve societal pro uh, problems, complex projects that solve societal problems, so they're multidisciplinary. So you have policy, engineer, computer scientists, educators, for instance, um, and part of that means with the expectations that you're going from perhaps basic research to applied research, to piloting and, and ultimately 
to transition or translation to an end user, whether that's health or military or whatever the end user it might be. So as Brad and others have talked about uh, today, there's the importance of involving those stakeholders early in the process so you understand how they will use that technology so you don't just develop a technology that gets handed off and not used, but there's also the importance of assessment and evaluation and then ultimately training and ed educating on that. So how do we uh, educate our K-12 uh, community and our, our um, undergraduates and our graduate students in this new way of doing research and this new expectations of the future of the, world, of the workforce? Terrific, thank you, Lee. So I'm wary of the time and uh, appreciate the folks uh, who were being brave about this very suitable topic. And so I want to thank the panel again, and I want to thank all of our presenters. And then I'm just going to wrap up with a couple things plus the Star Wars. So thank you very much. <laughs> and um, we didn't get to have the interactive discussion that we would have had if we had a two-hour uh, town hall. Um, but please feel free to stay for our reception and ask all of the hard questions, not only to these ladies, uh, but to all of our presenters. Um, and I want to close by just re referring back to IPAP's mission, right? So what was the full point of the mission and how do we want to go forward with respect to the research space that we've been talking about today? So the first part of our mission is to catalyze the interdisciplinary uh, research. And that's what this event has been about. A lot of these conversations have been percolating throughout the fall. We've been attending briefings in DC. Again, many people have been working in this area for decades, but how do we catalyze, how do we convene, how do we bring the community together? So come to office hours, come to the big block of cheese days, uh, participate in the think tanks, look for the opportunities. Please send us email, iPad at GoTech, mine at GoTech. Send us email about the projects that should be uh, in this portfolio. Because my job is to go to DC, my job is to work with Caroline and others to talk to partners to say, here's this portfolio of great ideas and great things that we can work on, but we need to find the funding, we need to find the partnerships, we need to find the resources. So that gets back to the second part of our mission, which is to create that continuity and capacity. How do we increase the capacity for us to not only uh, perform this research, but to lead in extraordinary ways? Um, and what you need to be telling us at iPad is, okay, if we just had this partnership, if we just had access to this, if we just cloned Ashok Cole, like we can clone Joe Watson, we will figure out how to do this. What type of capacity do we need to create? And everyone who spoke today, thank you, Keaton, everyone who spoke today has volunteered to help us um, to build that, build that out for our community. The third part of our mission is advocacy, and I think what we heard from Kay, what we heard from Rich, uh, and really all of our speakers across the board, is we have some opportunities to do our advocacy in new and powerful ways. There's the work that we do right now, like CACP, the filings to the FCC, to understand kind of the implications for uh, people with disabilities. What you heard from Rich and what was implied by others is our labor force is changing, and it is going to be an aging labor force, and it is going to be a labor force that has to be more inclusive. How do we build up the tools and technologies and platforms to make that possible? But what we also heard from Kay, Rich, and others is it, the advocacy in the tools that we create, in the tools that are training the Jill Watsons, in the tools that are creating the future AI systems that are shaping the future in a way, way that are profound and in many ways are black box systems that are, are really impossible to discern um, how they work today. What type of leadership as a public research institution can we express through the future of what these tools should be in the future. And then finally, not surprisingly, of course, our last part of our mission, mission is around education, right? Well, we've talked about that, but what we've heard today is that education is, uh, I keep thinking about my 16-year-old and 13-year-old kids, and I'm trying to figure out if they're ready for this world. I'm not ready for it. I hope they are. Um, but we certainly are changing what it means to think about education dramatically. I'm thrilled for the leadership of the commission uh, in terms of creating the next uh, at Georgia Tech. I'm a Georgia Tech alum. I'm so excited to see my university take that step forward in leadership, and I hope that we can do everything we can as our research community to support that, to catalyze that, and to take it in some new ways. So I'm really excited about how our mission aligns so well with these opportunities. And again, just thanks again to everyone for your participation today and your participation in the future.
So one of our, oops, sorry. One of our, don't get too close to the other microphones. Uh, one of our uh, traditions is how we honor um, and recognize the amazing contributions within our community. Uh, so we invented the iPad Star Award a number of years ago. It has been uh, given to amazing staff members, amazing faculty members, just people who go above and beyond around that mission that I just talked about. Um, and we wanted to take our January town hall as a way to recognize, I could say two Star Award recipients, but you'll know that I'm cheating on my math um, because appropriately, maybe because we've talked about the teams that we need to create, we're actually recognizing two teams. So I can't remember who's up first. Matt, if you come up here. So Matt is also winning and describing this team uh, through his nomination for uh, the, the PHDI team. So. Uh, Grab a mic. Yeah, I did create this slide. Yes, you did. Um, wow. Uh, so we, um, we recently had a milestone. So I, I actually don't know how many years it's been. It's been over five years since we uh, uh, we started this work um, when we uh, took on the CMS data set, uh, which had specific HIPAA requirements. And so uh, since then, we've housed a number of data sets from uh, healthcare providers that had similar requirements. Um, over the past uh, 18 months, um, the team has worked to actually meet certification through High Trust, uh, which is a third party um, uh, uh, process and um, uh, third party assessors that came in and worked with us. Um, and so um, this, is a, this is a pretty big deal. Um, it, was, uh, it was a lot of work um, and uh, we're hopeful that, that um, it's gonna both uh, give more opportunities to researchers to uh, make our services available to, to, uh, to folks and that they'll feel comfortable bringing data to us. Um, we're also hoping that it streamlines the process um, because a lot of times there's a lot of back and forth about what, what kind of controls do you have in place um, and uh, that's not always as rigorous as it should be. So um, uh, the people uh, who have done the lion's share of the work are listed there. Um, and uh, uh, there was a lot of work uh, on the operation side and the compliance side. And the other thing to highlight is that this is, uh, we're really proud of this, this is a 1GT operating model. So um, it's described as, you know, iPad has taken the lead in doing this, but um, we could not do it without GTRI uh, and OIT and, and uh, folks out in the units. So um, it's a... Uh, it's, it's a uh, fence painting uh, uh, <laughs> exercise by necessity because, uh, um, uh, you know, we need, we need help in budgets and personnel from across campus. So, um, so thank you. Congratulations. If you're a part of that team, please stand up. Megan, Richard, if you're part of that team, please stand up so folks can see you. Yay! Sean. And uh, one of the things I whoops, one of the things I want to mention is in this. So when iPad was one minute old, um, and Donna Highland had my cell phone number, which I learned not to give out as readily. Um, but Donna Highland was calling me, so she's the president and CEO of Children's Healthcare, and she said, you know what, Georgia, what we need is for Georgia Tech to get their hands on the Medicaid data sets because we can't understand our system to improve our delivery. And I was uh, sitting in my car in some sort of parking lot and just assured her, of course, we could do this. Um, because my job as director is to say yes, ask for the funding, and then pass it off to an incredible group of people uh, to make it happen. So we started with that incredibly important customer and partner uh, for us, but have turned this into an entire new capacity for research here on campus, and in doing so, made it a, a 1GT effort. So um, this is what happens when I give my cell phone number out to Donna Highland, but this is what happens when we all work together on campus to make it possible to do research that we never could do before. Now I'd like to bring up Lee because I've already flashed uh, the winner of the next team. Um, so uh, when we talk about bench to bedside, uh, this is an example of that where research expertise all the way into a system that is being used today. Right, it's, um, it's actually being piloted right now in, in Nick Multicum and Daryl Congratulations to Nick and Susan. Nick, Monica, we've been talking about your 
Thanks for the mentor of every single member raised here. Um, again, I've had my association throughout this time, led by Jim and I, with many thanks to uh, Sherry Clarisha, who brought this opportunity to the West so that we can be had, um, be made aware of this problem or this opportunity to exercise this leadership. I thought Mary Stride um, to the table to put it together and be the first time in history to call it out. is a solution for dispatch service workers who may be going into a situation, going into a home situation, but know that this is an emergency and they don't want to make an obvious decision to call the um, and, and just to bring to you this is like a small comment in my book because I'm just being very proud of this and I'm very proud that they are in the same age and the same age group. Um, so you might think of a lot of office jobs that we do in the program. Uh, we work very closely with the Academy of Public Health and Public Service, which I think is one of the finest and best in our country. So you can write down. So um, there's a button here on the front of this screen that will assist this emergency call and to get you to a calendar right now on your home computer. Okay? All calendars right now with um, the rest of the people that go out. In partner with the Georgia Tech Research Institute, we give you an emergency response system for the division's frontline case management division. QuickSafe is the division's new emergency response system. For aid case managers at the last line of defense, get the case manager by themselves in a dangerous situation or call 911 when it's not an option. While QuickSafe does not replace the case management protocol when requesting a law enforcement escort when it's necessary, QuickSafe is designed with a case manager's safety and well-being in mind. QuickSafe is a quick, easy-to-free alert system that enables law enforcement to pinpoint a case manager's location. QuickSafe is easy and secures the display and notify law enforcement when emergency assistance is needed. Once the case manager sets their location in the QuickSafe phone app, the QuickSafe system is activated when they call in. By pressing or holding the QuickSafe button for five <laughs> seconds, or clicking five times consecutively, the emergency system will send an alert to the emergency contact center, which will immediately contact 911 with the case manager's location and other pertinent information. Local division leadership will also be notified. QuickSafe will launch in select counties across Georgia in December of 2018. Access to the app will be immediate for designated case managers in those select areas. The safety of frontline case managers remains of utmost importance to both the Division of Family and Children's Services and the state of Georgia. By collaborating with the Georgia Tech Research Institute, the division now has an immediate response system to assist and protect case managers as they complete their most important job ensuring the safety of Georgia's children. So the other thing you need to know about iPad is that, of course, we started in a bar or restaurant. So of course, all iPad Star Awardees uh, get a bottle of wine with the iPad Star Award attached to it. Congratulations. <laughs>